So a Turkish court has rejected Australia's request to extradite Islamic State group terrorist Neil Prakash in a ruling that could see him released from jail unless Turkey decides to prosecute him. It comes two months after Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull said he expected the Melbourne-born Islamic State member to be extradited to face trial in Australia within months. Prakash has been held in a maximum security jail in southern Turkey since he was captured in October of 2016 uh, when he, while he was trying to sneak across the border from Syria. According to senior counter terrorism officials, he was a pivotal figure inspiring and encouraging terror plots in Australia. Well, Ikan Erdemir is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defence of Democracies and he joins us now from Washington. Ikan Erdemir, welcome. So what do you make of this Turkish decision not to extradite Neil Prakash to Australia? The judge says it's because conditions for the extradition had not been made available to the court. The Australians are considering an appeal. Does it sound like it's just a technical issue or are there other things coming into play here? Uh, at this point, it's early to comment on the case since we haven't yet seen the judge's ruling and reasoning. Uh, but uh, we can still speculate about the background. Um, in, in other extradition cases, uh, Turkish President Erdogan uh, has often uh, raised uh, w Western countries' refusal to extradite suspects demanded by the Turkish state uh, as pretext to refuse extradition to those countries. So there's, there is a tit-for-tat issue here. Uh, there has been threats uh, raised by uh, Turkish President Erdogan in other cases, especially with the United States. Um, so in this case, uh, that might also be the reasoning, uh, meaning uh, the Turkish courts could be seeing this as an opportunity uh, to convince Australia uh, to be lenient uh, toward Turkey's current and future requests for extraditions. Are you aware of any tension in that area at the moment with Turkey trying to extradite people from Australia to Turkey? Now, we know uh, in numerous cases uh, with United States, uh, with Germany and Greece, uh, and there have been similar cases where uh, there were tit-for-tat a kind of pushback from Turkey. Uh, concerning Australia, I do not have uh, any names on my list, uh, but this doesn't mean that there are no uh, ongoing debates. Well, Prakash is a self-confessed Islamic State member who disrespected the court in this latest hearing. Uh, apparently, Turkish uh, prosecutors have not laid any charges against him. Is there a real danger he might simply be released? Uh, the track record of uh, Islamic State militants in Turkish courts, uh, we see that uh, quite a number of them uh, have received parole uh, and quite a number of them have been treated leniently. Uh, ironically, in the Turkish courts, uh, you will get a very tough treatment uh, if you are uh, one of the academics for peace, uh, if you are a dissident, if you are a journalist, uh, and uh, you will have lengthy pretrial detentions. You know, one such case was recently uh, the infamous case of U.S. Pastor Andrew Brunson, uh, who has been under pretrial detention for 21 months. Uh, but if you're uh, an Islamic State or a suspected Islamic State militant, uh, there have been dozens of cases where people were allowed to uh, walk free. Uh, so there is always the danger that uh, Prakash uh, could end up uh, joining those other uh, released Islamic State militants. What, why does Turkey have that approach to um, self Well, Prakash is actually a self-confessed member of Islamic State. Now, it, it, it's, um, I, I think, difficult to tell how this case will go on. Um, you know, Australia has already raised the profile of Prakash, uh, so I think there will be uh, enormous pressure on the Turkish courts not to release him. Uh, whereas there were these uh, earlier cases where there wasn't a similar uh, kind of global attention. Uh, but nevertheless, I think there is always the risk uh, that uh, Prakash can uh, walk on a technicality here. Wow. Yeah. So, so you wouldn't be surprised if this does possibly end up with him be actually being released? Uh, yes, it would uh, fit the pattern uh, because there have been studies uh, looking at earlier trials of Islamic State militants. And uh, as I said, ironically, in the Turkish case, uh, they are they seem to be uh, treated much better than uh, Turkey's journalists, uh, opposition politicians or academics. Why is that the case? 
I think, um, you know, the t- Turkey's security apparatus first and foremost sees Turkey's domestic dissidents uh, as the main threat uh, to Turkey. Uh, and early on in the Syrian civil war, uh, jihadists uh, were seen uh, as a tactical ally uh, in uh, bringing forth a, a, a quick regime change in Syria. Um, after a couple of years of uh, kind of working with jihadists, I think the Turkish state realized uh, that that was a self-defeating uh, policy, uh, also uh, leading to uh, repercussions for Turkey itself. Uh, since then, Turkey toughened up uh, its act both on the border, which is now much less porous, and also is now uh, much tougher on the on, on various types of jihadists. But nevertheless, I think uh, there is still a, a muscle memory of uh, dealing leniently with jihadists while cracking down really hard on uh, Turkey's uh, dissidents of different colours. But haven't there been Islamic State attacks within Turkey as well? Or has the, the, the vast majority of attacks involved uh, people associated with the, the Kurdish push? Now, Turkey has had, especially, uh, you know, in 2015, 2016, attacks both by uh, Kurdish militants belonging to PKK and its splinter group TAK. But at the same time, there were a number of uh, high casualty Islamic State attacks, including uh, suicide attacks targeting Turkey's opposition rallies. Uh, And the Turkish state uh, was uh, blamed by the public back then uh, of not uh, acting tough on the Islamic State and not uh, preventing such attacks. Uh, But uh, in 2017 and 2018, uh, I can say that the security situation has improved much better. Uh, and jihadist attacks uh, on Turkish soil uh, have uh, declined dramatically. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens with this case with Prakash. Now, just uh, on a broader issue with Turkey, in the last 24 hours, a two-year state of emergency has ended after that attempted coup. What will effectively change now that that state of emergency has been lifted? Now, symbolically, this is a very important move. For the last two years, Turkey uh, has been run under the state of emergency, uh, renewed seven times. And after the seventh time, the government allowed it to expire. So as of um, yesterday morning, uh, Turkey is no longer under state of emergency. However, most analysts and legal experts argue that Turkey is now transitioning into a de facto state of emergency, Already the government uh, has passed new legislation, uh, draconian legislation, to restrict fundamental rights and freedoms. And at the same time, President Erdogan, following his election uh, under a a new arrangement as executive president, uh, has amassed enormous executive, legislative and judicial powers and is now basically the sole decision maker in Turkey. So we might argue that with the lifting of the state of emergency, Turkey is transitioning uh, from a, a de jure uh, state of emergency to a practical, a de facto state of emergency. And uh, for the average Turkish citizen, in terms of rights and freedoms, not much will improve. There's just some extraordinary figures associated what's, with what's happened there in Turkey over the past couple of years. Uh, 77,000 people charged with ter- terrorism-related offences, 150,000 public sector workers fired. Uh, you're, you're in the US, so uh, you're a former Turkish MP, uh, but what can you tell us what life is like inside Turkey now? Now, I, I think the, 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 the most telling uh, example of what life is like in Turkey is to say that uh, Turkish prisons are over 100 percent capacity at this point, And a vast majority of the inmates now happen to be, uh, you know, journalists, academics, uh, dissident politicians, former civil servants. Uh, in fact, uh, prison capacity is such a problem that as we speak, uh, Turkey is ruling a, a AK party and its ultra-nationalist ally, MHB, uh, are in talks to introduce a general amnesty. uh, But this general amnesty, ironically, will not release any of the political prisoners, uh, but it will release uh, common felons uh, to make space, uh, I guess, uh, for the next wave of uh, Turkish dissidents in Turkish prisons. And so, as a Turk yourself, a former Turkish MP, how, how do you feel about what is happening in Turkey now and about how that your nation is changing? 
And I think it's it's very important for Turkey to take a U-turn from this uh, backsliding into authoritarianism. Uh, this is not only important for rights and freedoms of uh, the common Turkish citizen, but it's also very important for Turkey's economy. Uh, lately, the Turkish economy uh, is in great trouble. Uh, we see a devaluation of the Turkish lira. We see a hike in interest rates. And also we see a, a, a slowdown uh, in Turkey's growth. Uh, and only Turkey's return to rule of law, uh, private property rights and free markets uh, could sustain the economy. Uh, authoritarianism uh, so far has not only hurt uh, Turkey's democracy, but also uh, its economy and finances. I can, Ermir, really interesting talking to you this morning. Uh, thanks for joining us there from the US. Thanks for having me.